people said, okay, look, we'll give it another week. You know, none of the pitches we're working on come off. Then, you know, it was fun, but we need to, we're going to get a contract. And then I think the next day we, we won a contract with BMW. Basically got a bank loan for 10 grand to buy some laptops, which was the only money we've ever borrowed. You know, we all feel like quitting sometimes, even, even as founders. Yeah. Actually having two people to perhaps hold the fort and, you know, allow you to just step back and have a bit of space, because that's so important, isn't it? Often, you know, people often say to me, like, you know, it must be great kind of running your own business. And it is, and I do love it. But, you know, I don't have a choice. I can never quit. I, I can't, I cannot leave. Hi David, how are you? I'm good, thanks. How are you? Yeah, I'm really well, thank you. Thank you for coming on. Um, so today, I just really want to dig into like the challenges of scaling to a hundred plus strong agency, which is for many agency owners is the dream, right? Um, but um, what I'd really like to uncover are some of the struggles and the lessons and, and that challenge of getting to that, because obviously it's not straightforward. So, as an intro, can you just um, tell us who Red Badger are and what you guys do? Yeah, of course. So Red Badger is a digital product consultancy. Um, and I often say that we solve complicated problems in complicated places. So we kind of sit below the commodity line in terms of solving <clears throat> those complex problems where you need a bespoke solution. Um, so where you can't just take something off the shelf and configure it, either because the problem you're solving is too complicated or, as is more often the case with us, the place in which you are solving that is too complex. Um, so our clients tend to be kind of enterprises and blue chips, um, for the likes of large banks, retailers, um, media companies, um, where those problems sort of exist. And so under the hood, we're about believing that all companies are now digital product companies, whether they realize it or not, and helping those enterprises and blue chips on that transformation journey to digital product thinking. Um, and that's through everything from the user experience, uh, design and research, the product design, all the way through to the correct implementation of agile lean teams, um, back to the, the all the way back to like your mainframe integration if needs be as well. So complex stuff, basically. Yeah, that's what we're all about. And uh, how big are you now, and how, how long have you been going? If we can go back to how Red Badger came about, that'd be great. Yeah, we're um, scarily enough. I think we're going to be 13 years old uh, in May this year, um, and so myself and two other. Uh, friends set Red Badger up in 2010. Um, we were all working for another consultancy called Kinchango, uh, which was a great consultancy. Um, and a lot of Kinchango's DNA uh, is in Red Badger for sure. Um, that was, I, I would say, one of the first consultancies that, in London that really got the combination of sort of creativity and technology uh, right or, or you know really saw the future in that which i know today sounds sort of glib but back then that really was un unusual it was all figuring it out back then it was really yeah, yeah. And it was, you know back then everyone was like you know you were an it consultancy or you were a design agency and never the twain really sort of sort of met um and yeah, I guess the, the three of us, myself, uh, Kane and Stu, like we all met working at Kinchango. And as I say, Kinchango is a great company. Um, lots, lots of very entrepreneurial people ended up, ended up working there. Um, and similarly did a lot of, you know, complex problems in, in complex places type problems. Um, ultimately that got sold to EMC. And as is often the case uh, with these things, it wasn't quite the same <laughs> after yeah. that. Um, and so the three of us were uh, running one of the big accounts there together. And so many sort of conversations in the pub uh, decided that, well, maybe we could do this ourselves. Um, and so we all kind of quit on the same day uh, and went off to try and uh, set up Red Badger. Did you have a client lined up at that point? Or was no, that, no. Well, there was a real chance of, uh, let's try and make it work. Uh, yeah, I think looking back, it was incredibly stupid, you know, but, um, <laughs> you know, the classic of like, you take a client with you is like, we didn't, I, I suppose reflecting on that is quite interesting, I think, to the heart of the values that we still have today, which is like we do, um, you know, like, honour is a thing and like doing things properly is, is a thing and not doing people over is a thing. Um, and so... You know, we've never been of the mind to kind of like think we're doing, you know, business to people. Um, mm. That's just not how we think and it's not reality anyway. Um, <clears throat> you know, business is business and a sale is, is two entities um, 
helping each other out um, where there's an actual you know an actual value exchange happening so yeah the, the sort of cloak and dagger of like stealing all the contacts and the and the, the clients like it never really was something we entertained um the, how did you how did you get that first client then? And wow. More importantly, yeah. how did Red Badger the name? Was that how many points deep were you in that? <laughs> <The name. laughs> or was yeah. it the name of the pub? Um, no, so the name was. Uh, yeah, it sounds so naff to say it now, but I always kind of think like coming up with company names is like trying to come up with a band name. Is that everything everything you come up with sounds terrible, uh, and you can only console yourself by sort of reflecting on famous bands' names. You know, like. You think, you think Blur or Pulp or Oasis or whatever, and like if you if you didn't have what you you know the history of all of the great records they've produced, uh, they would sound like pretty terrible names in the moment. Yeah. Um, but we we didn't want anything um, corporate. Um, we didn't want anything. We wanted something that was easy to spell, and that would be uh, memorable, um, and we wanted a dot com domain name. Yeah, we, we definitely came up with some real stinkers. And uh, funnily enough, you know, one of the mugs we have in our office, uh, we, we've kind of got a number of different mugs that we designed in the office. And one of them has all of the old, all of the terrible names that we came, oh, really? came up with sort of crossed out with, I think, like red badges, like in the bottom of the mug when you finish your tea. Um, yeah, they're, I'm not I'm not going to reveal what they are now. <laughs> they're too embarrassing. But I think I think when, about the time we were setting up, um, Microsoft Azure was in alpha or beta, and uh, the code name for that was uh, Red Dog, and we quite liked that. That just sort of met the mo, um, and so we just started riffing on kind of. I know it sounds stupid, but on like riffing on colours and animals. And I think it was actually my my wife will always take the credit for coming up with Red Badger, um, and it uh, sort of stuck, and there was just something about it we liked and it, it served us really well because it is a memorable name um and you know now wherever we go we kind of you know affectionately get called the badgers oh nice uh, by our clients and it's quite a nice thing it fits our culture really well in the sense that you know we're not just as i said like selling day rates and filling seats you know we're trying to genuinely build relationships with uh, our clients to help them and so there is like that affectionate aspect to it as well that kind of comes through. Um, yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, it, it's, uh, yeah, there's lot, there's lots of stories I could go, in, go into about that, but, um, yeah, it was good. So you obviously you all quit your job on the same day, you know, what did you do or sort of go into a, a, an office or how, how did you, how did you kickstart this agency? Cause at the moment you're, you're obviously three unemployed guys, yeah. presumably you've got bills to pay. Yeah. Um, so we, we had that whole conversation of like, you know, can we do it on the side? You know, can we try to, um, you know, keep our day jobs and do it in the evenings and weekends and sort of build up some sort of momentum? Um, and I think we are all of the opinion that, you know, that we've seen people try to do that and you just, and you never get the critical mass. Mm -hmm. And it's like, if we're going to do it, you know, like, let's take a run and run and jump at doing it. Um, and the three of us were all at a, 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 we were lucky that we had met. Uh, we were lucky that we got on and we were lucky that the three of us, I think, were at a point in our lives where we could take um, what many would see as a risk, but I was didn't see it as a massive risk. Um, you know, for Kane and I, who are pretty much bang on the same age, um, neither of us were married, neither of us had mortgages. You know, we all three of us had a little bit of savings, not very much, like I think we had like 10 grand or something. Um, but we didn't have much responsibility beyond that. And we were all eminently employable. So, you know, if it went wrong, you know, I'm, so I'm a software engineer by trade. Stu is still a software engineer. And Kane was sort of project manager and, and business business analyst. And so, you know, we had some savings to go on. And if it went wrong, we could go and get a contract, you know, we'd, we'd be all right. Yeah. Um, and Stu, who's, um, I would like to joke, is considerably older than, than, uh, than Kane and I, um, was at a point where his kids were just leaving university and so that financial sort of burden was was going away and so there's just a as is often the case there was just a lot of, t of timing um involved where we felt we could kind of have a run at it um i think the other thing was that the project we were working on at Kanjango um was 
a innovation project using um, gaming technology. And so uh, we'd been building this innovation project uh, for about a year and a half where we had uh, for a utility company actually built a gaming engine to run their utilities, which sounds kind of mad and actually things sort of coming full circle with sort of the metaverse, whatever you may think of that. Mm. It really was that sort of thing, but 14 years ago. Um, and we were really excited about what we had learned doing that. Um, and we had ambitions of building product in that space of kind of using 3D gaming technology in the in business applications. Clearly, we were way, way, way too early for that. But we spent quite a lot of time in the first couple of years. Well, I guess our, our aim was that we would do what we can do in terms of like software development effectively and bootstrap the, a product. So right. we would build IP, which would be this, you know, gaming technology and business applications would be IP that we would, we would build. And we would fund that by doing, you know, a day job of the consultancy work uh, that we knew how to do. <clears throat> um, and so we tried to do that for a couple of years um, without particularly going anywhere, had a few near misses um, where, you know, we nearly, we nearly sold something to, you know, you know, Haynes manual, the, oh, yeah. you know, so we, the cars. the cars, yeah. And you know, if you open those, they have like the, the beautifully hand-drawn exploded pictures of like a you yeah. know, distributor cap from a VWB. Well, I'm used to some mechanics, but I know what they look like. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so one of the one of the applications we had of this like three D technology would be like, wouldn't it be cool if you could actually like on your phone, um, actually take those those exploded diagrams and like interact with them, so that you could actually like take the distributor cap, pull it apart, look at it, say, oh, actually, I need that part, and then that would tell you, okay, your your nearest Halfords that has that part is, you know, three miles away, and that sort of thing. Was this before the iPhone where you could pinch and zoom and things like that, or was that after? it was. We were, we were very much like a Microsoft shop when we started. We're not anymore, really. We're kind of agnostic now. But um, it was at the time that Windows Phone 7 was launching. And because we, were quite, we had a lot of contacts at Microsoft, we got early access to the hardware. And right. they had a lot of... They had, at the time, I would say, they were a bit ahead of where um, Apple and others were in terms of having the Xbox gaming technology available on the, on the, on the Windows Phone on the Windows Phone. And so we were using, and that is what we built a lot of our uh, technology on, was the Xbox um, uh, technology, gaming technology. And so that, again, was just like a timing thing. So we got Microsoft were quite excited about that. They kind of helped us, as I say, in terms of giving us early access to hardware. Mm. And so we were just coming up with these different ideas and pitching it. And we got quite, you know, we got to the CEO of, of Haynes and went out to their factory and, and pitched it. And... That, that, that could have been the one, but it, it didn't quite come to fruition. So there was a few few things like that. Um, and ultimately what I would say is like change things around is our old boss, a guy called Mike Altendorf, or as everyone affectionately calls him, Dorf, um, had finished his earn out from the EMC acquisition and was looking to take on some sort of non-exec non roles. Um, and so again, fittingly in the pub, we kind of had that, handshake of yeah they'll come and help us um and he pretty much came in and said lads you can't do product and consultancy you did pick one mm -hmm. and so we said okay well we'll do the you know do the consultancy um and with, you know with a lot of help from dorf and his uh, black book of contacts then i'd say that's that's when things really sort of took off for us so it was the end of the first year or kind of you know within the year, you know, years one or two um we had a lot of irons in in the fire you know Stu and i were trying to build our IP, you know, our, our technology came without kind of hitting the streets, um, trying to sell the consultancy services. Um, we were trying, you know, trying to use effectively our CVs as red badges, kind of cr credentials of like what, what we're able to do. But obviously it's a hard, it's a hard pitch um, to make. Um, and we kind of got to the point, middle of year two, end of year one, where we had a lot of a lot of irons in fires, but nothing was quite coming off. Um, interestingly, we'd had a lot. We'd had a lot of offers to do like Mar and Par websites. Um, and What's we, Mar and Par websites? Sorry? You know, like um, someone's running a gardening service, or right. So the sort of stuff that today you would just like knock out on a Squarespace okay. website. Um, 
or you know, can we come in and just contract, you know, body shop that, like us coming in? And we always said no to those things because we always knew we wanted to do what we'd done throughout our entire careers, which was the big complex stuff. And if we couldn't do that as a business, like we can just go as contractors to do the other stuff. Yeah. And so that, that took quite a lot of discipline to say no to those things because it was like, well, if we do that, we'll get distracted from actually building a thing. Um, Did you not need the money though? I mean, how was you paying the bills at this point if, you, if you're turning well, down? Well, we were on, you know, living on fumes. So like I, um, was, I moved house to so that I could walk to Stu's house, you know, so that I wouldn't have to spend money on petrol and uh, on train fares, and you know, we weren't going out and you know, just living very cheaply. Mm. Um, but it was, you know, it was fun. It wasn't like a hardship. It was, it was, it was fun for the most part. Um, and we kind of got to the point where, <clears throat> yeah, we were all running out of money. We were running out of money. And so there was an infamous sort of meeting in the Wag Wagon and Horses in Surbiton, uh, which is where Stu and I lived, um, where we sort of sat, on the, sat around the table and said, OK, look, we'll give it another week. And if none of the things we, you know, none of the pitches we're working on come off, then, you know, it was fun, but we need to, we're going to get a contract and yeah. get, get, let's go and get a job sort of thing. And then I think the next day we, we won a contract with BMW, and then, then like the day after that we won a contract with the German government, which were two two of the sort of pitches we were in. And then we were kind of away, um, and then we were like, okay, we actually need some people to do the work. We need some kit to do it on, um, and we <clears throat> basically got a bank loan for ten grand to buy some laptops, which was the only money we've ever borrowed uh, in our thirteen years, wow. um, and got some mates together and contractors and kind of went after it really. Um, That's a then, brilliant tale really of, of, you know, yeah, taking that chance and then winning the business and then actually figuring out how to do it, I guess. Then, then you've got, you need the people, you need the equipment. Yeah. And like doing it was okay because like we were good at that and we knew people that were good at it as well. Um, and it was, uh, yeah, it was like you, you kind of, you know, pull it, pull it all together at the last minute. But, um, and then, of course, you know, combined to that, as I said, with um, Dorf, our old boss, coming as a non-exec, he obviously brought an enormous wealth of contacts and networks that he could introduce us to, as well as massively shaping, you know, our, how we sort of positioned ourselves. Um, and then from there, really, we were kind of into the classic phase of sort of the feast and the famine, where you spend loads of time trying to win the work, then you spend loads of time doing the work, and then when you've done the work, you've got you don't have any more work to go to, and then you spend all the time trying to try find some more. You know it's that incredibly lumpy phase, um, where you're basically trying to build up enough capital in the business that you can then um, start to smooth out some of those those um, those peaks and troughs um, by having more enough people that are out there doing the hunting. But I'd say that. I, that was years, years and years where you're kind of gradually, gradually sort of smoothing. And it's still, to a certain degree, that never goes away in a consultancy model, right? And mm. um, you're always, you're in a constant battle to balance supply and demand effectively. And that is, that is the trick of running a consultancy. Yeah, yeah. And, and in terms of that first hire then, so there's the three of you presumably doing the work. Where where did you go first in terms of was it was it delivery you know how did your roles evolve if you like so in terms of running the business was there one of you then focused on sales or marketing one on project management one on delivery or you know how yeah. did that business grow from the three of you it was pretty much um, that you know Stu and I were both for technology um, I've always been technology and sort of delivery I've always been a very passionate advocate of all things agile for very 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 long time from the very early stages and so so between Stu and I really we would handle the delivery and the the technology side of things um Kane did everything else in those early days so Kane was definitely the, you know the sales guy the finance guy um the ops guy all the rest of it which is sort of hilarious we, we look back on that as sort of hilarious now because Kane's pretty uh not the most organized <laughs> person people uh on on the finance side of things um and actually my um my dad uh 
has owned and run many many business or had owned run ran many businesses over the years and was an accountant by trade and so he very kindly did a lot of work and advice for us on deferred payment terms um which he did eventually get paid many years <laughs> later um and worked worked with Kane on kind of the admin side of stuff as well um but that was kind of how things fell down those lines for probably the first four or five years um and then partly because going back to Kinchango, you know where our, our old place partly because there had been a mass exodus of people there there was quite a lot of like talent for us to pull on oh, nice. um of people that we knew were good and you know we've still got people that work for us now that used to work for Kinchango, um which is fantastic so we had quite a good pool of you know people that we just knew were good for it um i think the first actual and and they're all on a contract basis you know um so i guess that, that lack of recruitment fees must have helped that you know, yeah yeah uh, yeah. you know get, pulling on that pool of that network of people yeah um is a big drain isn't it especially when you're trying to grow yeah yeah definitely and we just we, we always you know it was gradually gradually building up the permanent base alongside like the contract base mm. um very slowly over the years um yeah it's, it's not it's not a particularly interesting story in that if i'm honest i think it was just no worries. yeah so was there a tipping point where you moved from sort of startup to, you know, what we call like a proper business? So all of a sudden it's, you know, not um, not that hustle every day, I guess, of trying to win those new clients, like you, you described those dips and, and where you suddenly realise, oh, hang on, we've got to start putting HR policies in place yeah. and things like that. Always hustle every day, Chris. You, ne ne yeah. never, never, you can never lose the hustle. It's a dirty uh, word these days, though, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I don't, th I don't think so. I think you lose sight of that and you kind of... I agree. You, you yeah. lose something, but um, yeah, I think I think you know, like four or five years into it, we definitely had that kind of like, okay, what are our roles? Um, there was a book that we were reading at the time uh, called The E Myth. I don't know if you ever come across that one. Uh, the visionary, the integrator, and the technician. Yeah, I think so. Is that what it was? But the uh, bit... the, the, um, there's a, like an apple pie shop. That's and it. There's That's a lady it. that uh, exactly. basically was, would make make the pies, wasn't it? And, and she made them perfectly and she could never grow because she insisted on laying out the counter every day, making exactly. the pies and nothing was ever going to be good enough. Yeah, exactly. And that, that was the sort of the, the bit that stuck with me from that, that, that book was like, so I, I can't remember what her name was. Let's, let's call her Jan, you know, yeah. <laughs> where, you know, if she, you run a business that is Jan's, you know, pies, at what point uh, do the pies, you know, in the beginning, you know, Jan is making the pies, so they are Jan's pies. They are Jan's pies, yeah. At, at what point do you get to a scale of business where you need somebody else to make the pies and are they still Jan's pies is um, the sort of pivot point where we were like, and, and one of the other things that that book talks a lot about is the difference between working in the business and working on the business. Yeah. Um, and that, is very much the kind of peaks and troughs that we, you know that happen in a consultancy where you kind of like you work on it for a bit you win some stuff or some stuff needs to do and then you kind of dive down into the detail and you're working in it for a bit and then you kind of come back up again um and yeah we sort of um i suppose by that point as well you know the three of us had worked together for long enough that we knew what our respective strengths were and were not um and so it was probably around that four or five year mark where we said, okay, well, uh, Kane is developing into, you know, very good, uh, sales guy and sort of marketing guy and great out on the market, not amazing at managing the receipts and <laughs> working with my dad on all of the operation side of stuff. Uh, and that was really becoming my, but it was clear that, that was better, a better fit for me. Um, and so, and Stu was clearly still all about like being on the front line of technology and still is today actually. And so we basically split up and said, okay, Kane will go to sort of CEO, focus on the sales and marketing. I'll go to the COO and do focus on the operations side of stuff, not just the internals, but also how we actually do the client delivery. Um, and that Stu would remain focused on sort of technology and that worked really well and probably that was true until about two years ago probably um that that 
that separation of concerns was was um was a good fit for us um and allowed us to work well together not stepping on each other's toes clear lines of responsibility so do you think that gave you an advantage so a lot of founders are sort of sole founders and and you know myself included i i take that visionary role now but i had to bring in because uh you know like kane useless at uh, <laughs> organization and operations if you like in terms of being the most organized person so bringing in a coo or bringing in a leadership team do you think that gave you an advantage that you kind of had you know three of you there in, in those perfect roles very right from the start 100 percent. i think it's a massive advantage we've had and i don't know how you've done it, Chris, in terms of doing it on your own. I don't, mm. I don't have that experience at all. And I'm incredibly grateful that I've had two um, friends and partners that where we've gone through it together sort of thick and thin. Yeah, because it can be so like, lonely in terms of the thoughts. And, and yeah, for me, I've now got Saeed, thankfully, who's, who's our COO. And yeah. it's just nice to have someone. And obviously, as, you know, over the last few years as well, we've brought in FD and we've got yeah. advisors and things like that, which help you allow to sort of um, express what you're going through and, and you know because the rest yeah. of the time if you're on your own you've just got to go home and cry in the corner basically and not show any weakness to yeah honest. yeah exactly and like I'd say that you know that dynamic between the three of us has changed obviously and evolved over the years but it's still like you know if we're up against the wall or sorry if we're backs against the wall like that's still like we'll turn to each other in terms of okay, okay what are we doing mm. um, and you know it's a double-edged sword isn't it because I Often, you know, people often say to me, like, you know, it must be great kind of running your own business. And it is, and I do love it. Um, but I also then say, but, you know, I don't have a choice. Um, I can never quit. I, I can't, I cannot leave. Um, and having two other co-founders who are in that same position is a massive relief often because anyone you do bring in externally, as committed as they may be, like, they will always have the option to go do you know what it's not really for me or you know what i'm going to move to a different country or you know they, they can sort of quit and get another job whereas as founders you just don't think that never even enters into your mind you know it's not an option i guess there's times when like you say where you do because you know we all feel like quitting sometimes even even as founders <laughs> actually having two people to perhaps hold the fort and you know allow you to just step back and have a bit of space because that's so important isn't it regrouping and I think you know sometimes you know I'm not at the races and they fill in and vice mm. versa and some I feel very lucky that I think you know anyone who's had any form of success in life you know has to, has to be aware of the luck they've had along the way and the time the timing and so just the, you know that timing I talked about at the beginning yeah, which yeah. just so happened the three of us were at a stage of life um, where you know we could do it and wanted to do it uh, was was lucky. You know? Well, it's also those those two pitches that you talked about as well, and I think that's that's the thing. It's very easy to at, at times when you you, you think oh, it's done, you know, if we're done, if we're, if something <laughs> needs to happen, and and yeah. there always just seems to be it is a bit of luck, really, isn't it? That that's, that one thing normally does happen. If you yeah. look hard enough, you can normally make that one thing happen that needs to and it can it can turn it around yeah yeah but i think you need that uh, resilience don't you as a founder to sort of have that thought in the back of your mind that it's yeah. going to be all right you know we're going yeah. to make something happen yeah. yeah and also that i've always been like well you know what? if it doesn't it's okay and i think that gives you a power in itself yeah that gives you the you know a, a a confidence to kind of go well you know it you know I, I can go and get another job I, I i still think that today you know like 13 years later it's like i could i could go you want another it. job now though i mean i'm like that now oh, like, God, no. I, don't want, I, don't, I don't want it but like i still feel like i could get one so yeah, like, yeah. it all came crumbling down um because i think if you, you know if you can't have that objectivity you go insane don't you well if you can't you know if you completely fear failure you know, you've got to have a bit of no fear there because otherwise yeah. you'll, you'll never take the right chances, will you? you know? Yeah, and that's my point is like, you know, what does failure mean for me? It's like it means I have to go and get a job somewhere, which mm. I could do and it would be okay. It's not what I want, but it's, you know, it's a pretty decent safety net, right? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. So was there, um, you know, at this point, um, you know, going from sort of 10 people then to 20, because I think this is where it gets complicated and, and, and difficult and again luckily you had I guess the right people around you but you know f fueling that growth and, and, and 
suddenly you've got 20 salaries to pay and you've got a, mm. an office and you've mm. you know all these new things that these new costs that come about yeah what fueled that growth from 20 to 50 was it again you know that network that you'd built up or did you have to sort of find a new way of marketing and, and winning new business uh we've definitely always been very reliant on kind of network and referral and rep reputation um even today like probably too much today um we'll talk about that later perhaps hmm. um <clears throat> i think there was also you know the di digital transformation kind of uh, market shift was occurring and we were we were very well placed i think to help with that i think that um we always had in our hearts that we were building we were as, as interested and cared as much about um the sort of user experience as we did the technology in fact we often used to say when we thought about our positioning that we i'm going to be a bit, bit rude here about a couple other companies it, this is 10 years ago let's say um that we sort of saw in the market that you had your akqas who yep. would build you know do nikes huge huge you know nike sort of um sort of digital stuff and but like it would it would look really good but under the hood it wouldn't it would be a bit of a mess in terms of the code and the technology and then on the other side you had like a thoughtworks who would build really good solid code and you know mission critical stuff but would be an absolute dog dinner in terms of the usability and so our we saw those two as like and we were like the ven was like we want to build stuff that looks great on on the surface and is great to use as well as like is solid and has that you know looks great under the hood as well um, and I think that, you know, clearly that's where the market has just gone. Um, and so we, we called that one right and caught, caught a bit of that as well. Mm. Um, and then I think, yeah, it was definitely um, getting into those digital transformation um, projects that, that fueled a lot of growth. I think we, Stu's always like has a canny knack of picking, picking the right technologies to back as well. Um, and so, you know, no JS, we were very early to because Stu called that one. And I remember we did quite a lot of uh, like no JS content on a website in terms of campaigning around that. And our non-exec and good friend Dorf uh, said, you're never going to win anything with that, lads. Um, and then the next week, Tesco called up out of the blue um, saying, oh, you know, we want to we were looking for someone to help transitioners to Node.js and like you're pretty much the only website out there that's talking about it. Oh wow, okay. Um, and as is often the case, you know, the first two or two attempts to get into Tesco didn't work, but the third one did. And then that was a massive um, client for us in terms of we helped them rebuild their European grocery um, engine or platform um, for the whole of Europe um, and was massive, you know, and that, that then became a good example where we've always had um, or became where I think our USP emerged and where we, we saw our value all of a sudden became obvious, which was finding those projects that are like incredibly are strategically important and that makes us very sticky. So we're not doing something that is easy to stop because if you're, if you're Tesco and you are rebuilding your European grocery platform, um, you don't stop that. That's not um, going to be done in two weeks and then see you later. Weeks, yeah. Exactly. Um, and that's been the history of Red Badger really is that, that we've had these pillar clients, you know, that where there's one, usually one client that is the majority, the big client and it lasts two, three, four years uh, around which other clients are kind of then built. Mm. Um, and then that peters out and then the trick is like finding the next one and finding the next one and finding the next one. And so through the years, you can see that that was Tesco and then it was, or actually it was Sky and uh, Tesco and Fortnum and HSBC and Nando's and Santander. And like uh, those have been the, the ones that have given us the foundation and therefore confidence to sort of push on because you feel like you, you that's, that's a decent sized client that's not going away and you can kind of use that to fuel your next stage of growth. Was there, did you have to go for any lessons in that point? So in terms of having that Goliath client, because it's very easy to get comfortable when you get that one Goliath client, but obviously that's always at some point going to come to an end. I mean, we had it with eBay. We worked with them for six or seven years and, and it was 
fueling this growth for Honcho and it was it was great but in the back of yeah. your mind you're like you know if this ends what do you do then yeah yeah and I think we again talking about luck like I think we were um we have been very lucky in terms of not having uh, until really the pandemic actually like having had that big client kind of disappear unexpectedly I don't think that I think that's true true to say um we've all, we've always been very aware of having that um that big client and being over over overly dependent on it and for, for years we've had had a drive of like we, we mustn't have any one client that's bigger than 30 percent and that doesn't mean reducing it it means building the rest of the business around yeah. it um did you have to learn any lessons to get to that decision though i mean what what sort of made you gave you that mindset was that was there anything that gave well, you that i think mindset? like our you know, you know our dorf had ran Kanchango for 15 so he years. had the experience you had that experience had guidance a lot lot i mean he's been absolutely pivotal in that experience and guidance mm. having been there and done it before um and so would you advise like in terms of mentorship you know yeah. like someone early on in their journey how, how important would you say that is because a lot of us wing it obviously but and, and can't afford it sometimes or yeah find the wrong mentor or i think um it it, it was definitely transformational for us and i'll, I'll always um you know, Dorf will always have a special special place in my heart in terms of like what what he's helped us do. Mm. Um, but I can also, so I think it's re really important if you can find the right person, and that is, you know, again, just a bit of luck. I think we had yeah, yeah. doing that, and we've over the years tried to bring in other non execs that haven't really stuck for one reason or another, which maybe that's our fault as well. I don't know, um, and so. And there's definitely people we've brought in who've been totally duffers um, and you waste a lot of time and money and effort mm. on it as well. And it is really hard, but it, it's the same problem you have in every facet of the business, right? Is it when you have a people business, it's, a, it's about the people. Yep. Um, and finding the right ones is what you spend the majority of your time doing. And so that is true at, at every single level of the business. Um, I think it's, I don't know if it if it's always been this way or whether it's harder now. There's certainly a lot. There's a lot of people out there that like to think they would like a portfolio career. Um, but what advice do I have on that one? I I think you really do need to find people that have you know what Dorf's superpower is that he really had done exactly what we were trying to do before, mm. and I think that is really important. There is definitely value and advantage to having. Um, you know, advice and guidance and people from different walks of life. But if you haven't walked, you know, a hundred miles in, in your shoes, that, that is, that is invaluable. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so I think finding someone that has that tight fit and therefore they have the empathy and the affinity, I think empathy is massively important is that if you've never run a consultancy or an agency and you've never had those moments where you have lost a big client and or, or you win the big one you can't resource and all of those sort of peaks if you've never had that emotional experience mm -hmm. you will never know what you're really talking about in terms of how to handle those and um, so that's probably the biggest advice is that yes definitely try to find somebody but don't force it i think what about the um finding that right person as well because i think a lot of one easy trap to fall into is is getting a mentor and think right i've got a mentor now but then mm -hmm you know three six months nine months or or, or you know it could get to two years and, and yeah. in the back of your mind you're thinking this isn't the right person but i'm now committed to this person and but you're not you know, you're not committed are you know well i think it's, it's an easy trap to fall into isn't it i mean i think yeah. is it is it a case of setting up from the start that you know we'll give this three months or six months and then yeah i mean i think uh i think you just always have that option right it's like no, no, nothing is sacred um and you know, the biggest thing I've learned over the years is to have objectivity. Like, I think if you can develop objectivity, which I, 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 I'm not saying I'm amazing at, at that, but have got a lot better, um, mostly through having um, various different coaches helping me with that over the years, um, to be able to kind of observe yourself from above and, like, the, the surroundings around it. Um, and... You do, I, I think you learn that 
you get to points where you're like, ah, doesn't th- something doesn't feel right. This all feels too hard. I'm tired. This isn't fun anymore. Those are all kind of like signs that you need to make a change. Mm. Um, I think that's the biggest, you know, big thing I always say to myself and to others as well is like, if something feels hard, you're doing it wrong. You know, and like work should be fun. It should be energizing. It shouldn't be kind of stressful and detracting. And if it is, like something is wrong and you need to make some change. And so then it's about trying to step back and kind of like, okay, well, what what is the change I need to make? Um, what is, you know, could be a small thing, it could be a large thing. And I think, um, you know, that's, again, when it comes to advisors and coaches, is like, are they actually, you know, is this a net positive or a net negative? And trying to look at things in that way. Yeah. yeah. Uh, was it always the plan or, you know, was it, was it a dream or was it a plan to sort of build an agency this big or did, did that happen by accident? Um, yeah, I, I mean, uh, it'd be nice to say there was a plan, wouldn't it? But um, <laughs> kind of, kind of... Well, I mean, you know, when you when the three of you were sat there in that pub, you know, was, yeah. it, was the dream, you know, build a hundred strong agency or was it? Have a bit of fun, or was it build a product that you could yeah. sell and retire and sit on a beach? Yeah, or was it it, all, all of the all of the above, yeah. various <laughs> different times, you know. Um, I think you talk to some people that have been at Red Badger for a, a number of years and that you know we know as well. They'll reflect that we probably variously said, "Oh, you know, we never want to be bigger than 20. Mm. and then when we got to twenty, it's like, "Oh, we don't want to be bigger than forty, and then when you get to forty, um, and I think the thing that I've learned on that is like. Um, standing still is incredibly dangerous and so um, if you have that mentality of like I don't want to be bigger than 40 or 50 or whatever the number is um, then you'll be smaller than that because you'll get you know the moment you stop trying to push forward um, you'll lose that client that you thought you wouldn't lose and mm-hmm. then you're, you've got nothing to fill fill the gap and so the, f- the, the safest place by, by a long long shot is being on the front foot um, and pushing for growth um, and I reason and that doesn't come from like a megalomaniac kind of like I want a huge enterprise I sort of reason that from the point of view of like well a it's the safest place to be like if I've got a growth problem like that's a good problem to have and um, B it actually pushes me as an individual so as the business gets bigger I have new challenges that I have to solve that I didn't have before by virtue of that scale and I like I like having new problems to solve. That's what gets me out of bed in the morning. Um, plus, I think the work that we do is actually really good. I think we're really good for our clients. And I think that we're a really good employer. So I think we're really good for our employees as well. So if we can do that for more people, then that's a really positive thing that we are doing for the industry and for people and for people's families and, and their lives as well. And so in that respect, I'm like, well, we should therefore always be trying to do more. Um, and more of it mm. because those things I think are positive positive things to focus on I think like fueling that growth though because um, obviously we're a people business agencies yeah. and to fuel that growth and to go the next step beyond you need to bring in better people and you need to invest more and more in, in, in bigger salaries and more experience yeah. and everything else was there any a point ever a point in your business where you thought maybe we'd get investment to do this because obviously to, to never borrow any money and not have that growth completely fueled organically is, is yeah. quite an achievement. Yeah. Was there any uh, ever a sticking point where you thought, well, because I mean, in our business, we always have, you know, there's always 10 people I'd love to recruit and 10 skills that we haven't got that we'd love yeah. to have. Um, um, I mean, yeah, obviously, like we've talked about it and considered it on and off, you know, over the years. Um, we've always tried to run the business kind of in a sort of just in time model. So it's sort of like, as back to that thing of like when things feel a bit stretched and a bit hard, it's like you then that's the next push that you make, mm-hmm. but not before. Like it's very easy to fall into the trap, and we've definitely done it, of where you design the business you want, and you go, okay, well, you know, we're going to build a, an innovation practice, so I'll bring in a head of innovation, um, or we're going to build a data practice, so I'll bring in a head of data, and that and that will then magically appear. Yeah. Um, as a po- which it doesn't, by the way. <laughs> um, as opposed to the sort of thing of going, oh, you know, lots of people are asking us to do data projects and we're struggling to kind of resource it properly or it's getting beyond the realms of that we can kind of do. We need to bring somebody in to help with that. And it's like that sort of pull, 
pull rather than push way of thinking and stretching yourself as as much as you can without screwing stuff up before you kind of like go okay now I'll bring in that next senior person because the demand I can feel the demand is there yeah, yeah. Um, and I think any time we've tried to go down the sort of build it and they'll come route has gone wrong for us that hasn't worked um, maybe it has for others and that's just like an inability of us our, our own um, but I think that's just been the mentality I think and so you know if you took investment uh, what would you do with it? You would sit around designing your head of innovation, head of data. And, you know, I always sort of said that in the early days when we didn't take investment. It's like if we did take investment, we would have spent a lot of time designing beautiful meeting rooms and coming up with what should, the, you know, what mountain ranges should they be named after and all of that bollocks. And instead, like we were hungry and that was like, we've got to, we've got to get the net, you know, the thing you get focused on what really matters. Um, which is the core business fundamentals. Uh, and if you lose sight of those, they bite you in the arse. Yeah, yeah. What happened um, during COVID then? I mean, was you was you affected by that much? Mm. Did it really, um, you know, was there a point there, like with most agencies, all of a sudden have budgets paused and yeah, definitely. clients disappearing? I mean... Yeah, it was a very scary time. Um, I think for everyone, right? Like nobody knew that April 2020, Nobody knew anything, did they? There was no. no vaccines. We didn't really know what was safe, what was happening. Um, and so most people froze, you know, in, in place. Uh, and there was a dash for cash, really. So um, lots of things got, lots of deals that were about to get signed didn't get signed. Um, and clients that did pull things. Um, it was, yeah, it was very, a very, very disrupting time um, and did, you didn't know where it was going to end, really. Was mm. What was your plan point. when that happened? You know, when it locked down and all of a sudden, did, mm. did three of you get yourself in the war room and... and yeah, we did. I mean, by, by that point, you know, we, we'd we already built up a very good uh, sort of management team and that already was working, you know, we, for years had worked well together. And so we kind of, we set up a little task force of a COVID that, that was kind of like work, you know, just sort of... Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Doing uh, scenario planning. Okay, okay. What if this happens? What if it, down to the level of like, what if someone gets COVID in the office, like before the lockdowns when mm. it was kind of coming? What if a client gets COVID? You know, all of these sort of like, what if, what if, what if, what would we do? Um, and so we did lots and lots and lots of scenario planning. Um, and so when those things did happen, like we already kind of had some plans in place, um, and. We also went back to kind of going, okay, what are our what are our principles that we're going to run by here? Like, what are the objectives? Um, and so we set out very early that we we're like, okay, we, we want to avoid making redundancies. So that's that's like number one. Um, we want to stick to kind of the values that we had, um, and then that kind of like that guide you in terms of therefore what you know what should I do in this sort of situation? But um, yeah, I mean, like terrible couple of years, honestly, in terms of the the roller coaster ride of of that. Um, definitely learned a lot of things I could quite happily have, have done without learning for sure. Mm. And then coming out of that COVID, have you seen a, a positive market? Have you seen good growth since that? When did, it, when did that moment change? It's been very jittery, I would say. Um, and it's been fits and starts, but you know, I'm sure for everyone, you know, last year felt like a big uh, unlocking of uh, pent up. It and did, then, yeah, and, and then it went back in again when uh, Ukraine and well, there was you know, yeah. Ukraine inflation, yeah. the UK Liz Truss. Uh, yeah. was uh, it's only twelve days though, right? Yeah, yeah, but um, <laughs> what, what, amazing what you can accomplish in twelve days. Yeah, isn't it just? Um, and you know, I think now that's again just drove everyone back to being okay. Well, hang on a minute, like let's just wait and see. And I think we're just still at that point now where there's still a lot of um, uh, there's still a lot of wait and see going on. So it's it's lumpy, you know. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Um, so in terms of what you would say to someone who is thinking of starting an agency with your 13 years experience, yeah. is there a bit of advice you'd give them, or what advice would you give your younger self at the beginning of your journey? Do you think? Um, I think you've got to 
do it for the right reasons. It, it, I love doing it and it's, it's a great, I think they are great businesses to run. Um, I love solving problems and there's, you know, there's always, both in terms of like solving our clients' problems, but solving our own problems as well. And that's in a consultancy, that's incredibly fertile ground, right? Cause you, you know, get the privilege of working in many different sectors on many different types of problems. Um, which is really stimulating. So I, I get bored very easily. And so that, that variety um, and the challenge that comes with that is a really good tight fit for me. And so not knowing that uh, is an important thing. Um, I think for anybody running a business though, I would say do not enter it with this idea of like, I'm gonna do this for five years and I'm gonna sell it for this. Cause that you will not do that. And that will make you make the wrong decisions. And I've definitely seen over the 13 years of do, doing this uh, companies that have had that sort of attitude and they're not around anymore yeah, yeah. And that didn't work very well um, so I think having a focus on like your your focus is building a great business which means looking after your people and um, caring about your, you know just caring about things is really obvious right um, mm. and being able to focus on enjoying what you do and having other people that work for you enjoy what they do as well which is really hard and is not always true, um, but that's the North Star, I think. And if you have that, and then you do want to exit the business, you'll have options. Yeah, keeping those options open, I guess, is, is really important. And what's, what's next for Red Badger then? What's the aspirations now, now that you're 100? Is it global domination? Is it acquisitions? Is it... Is um, it I think, again, it's that, it's that growth thing, but it's like f figuring out where's the pull, like where, you know, where should we go? And that sort of preemptive, trying to be a bit preemptive to that, but the sort of just in time um, piece. So I think we're very blessed in that we have a fantastic team and, you know, we're good at, we're really good at what we do and, you know, we're very proud of the work that we do as well. Um, and whilst, as I said earlier, you can never, never not have that hustle. You can never take your eye off that and never be complacent. Um, it's about, you know, creating the, um, the, the space in which we can then look to add, add to that sort of arsenal of capabilities. Um, and so what else can we do to help our clients and how else might we build those things out? Um, you know, and how might that then give me and the people that run the business some fresh challenges for ourselves as well. So mm. for me, it's always like, how do we get the, the growth? Where is it? Um, but from a point of view of therefore that, that has the potential to be fun um, not purely just like there for, just right for the sake yeah. of it yeah exactly yeah, yeah that's brilliant well thank you very much for coming on it's been it's been really fascinating hearing your story um yeah. i'm sure the listeners will get a lot of value from it great thanks chris it's been fun thanks very much david cheers you've been listening to confessions of an agency owner with me chris ailey you can connect with me on linkedin subscribe to my newsletter and find out more about my agency at honchosearch.com and don't forget to hit the subscribe button until next time